Hello there. I'd like to share a project that I've been working on for quite some time now, which I call the Nestronic. What is it? Well, it's a Nintendo video game music player alarm clock. Yes, I know that's kind of a mouthful. Basically, it's a device that combines two project ideas that I've been kicking around. First, it takes the CPU from an original Nintendo Entertainment System, which also contains the NES's audio synthesizer hardware, to authentically play video game music. Second, it's an alarm clock that can synchronize its time over the internet and uses a real battery-backed crystal oscillator to keep accurate time. This means that I will be able to wake up to the theme from Super Mario Brothers or Blaster Master and not worry about clock skew due to power outages or waking up at the wrong hour due to a daylight savings time change. The project has come a long way since the initial breadboard prototype to the current Revision A printed circuit board based version. Since you never get anything right the first time, now we're going to be building a Revision B Nestronic. This version makes a few tweaks to the enclosure and fixes all the problems I found in the circuit board the first time around. You know, things like backwards transistor footprints and ambient light sensors shrouded in permanent darkness. As always, there are links in the description to a series of blog posts where I go in-depth on the design and implementation of the device. So without any further ado, let's get started building an Estronic. The first step was to review the schematics and printed circuit board layout for the main board, followed by the schematics and printed circuit board layout for the input board. I then placed the orders for the printed circuit boards from Osh Park and orders for the solder stencils from Osh Stencils. I then did an inventory of all my components left over from Revision A and ordered anything else I would need from DigiKey. As the remaining components arrived, I made sure everything was nice and organized. Having a printout of the bill of materials for the printed circuit boards made this a simple matter. I grouped components by type and placed all the bags into a dedicated bin. While waiting for the printed circuit boards to arrive, I decided to prepare the enclosure. I reviewed all the design details in Fusion 360, making sure everything looks good. I then let loose on the 3D printer. Over the course of several days, I printed the base, the top, the bezel, and all the buttons and fittings. Then I got out the sandpaper and smoothed all the edges. Finally, I installed heat set inserts for the screw holes. In the base, I used a soldering iron to heat them up. In the top, I used a fatter tipped desoldering gun to do the same. The last step prior to print circuit board assembly was to prepare a few of the electronic components that I would need to hook everything together. First, I put the ESP32 microcontroller module into a handy test jig, made sure it was working correctly, and burned the flash voltage e-fuse. This step is necessary to prevent certain pull-up resistors on the printed circuit board from affecting the device's bootstrap configuration. Second, 
I programmed the EEPROM that would contain the code for the NES CPU. I then soldered a pin header to the display module. This is one of the largest monochrome graphic OLED displays I could find, even if it doesn't look very big. I went with OLED so that it would look better at night in a dark room. Finally, I soldered a cable onto the speaker. With all of that out of the way, it was finally time to open the Oshpark envelope with the printed circuit boards and the Osh stencils envelope with the solder stencils. We're finally ready to put this thing together. I started by securing the main printed circuit board in a jig, and then aligning the solder stencil on top of it until all of the pads line up with the holes. I then dispensed and smeared the solder paste across the board. When this was done, I carefully removed the stencil, revealing a board with solder paste on the pads and ready for component placement. Over the course of the next several hours, I went through all my component bags, and with the aid of a microscope, carefully placed about 80 individual components. I used tweezers for most parts, though a vacuum tool worked better for some of the larger chips. Finally, the board was fully populated, with the surface mount parts at least, and ready for baking in the reflow oven. After reflow, I carefully inspected all the solder joints. Since everything looked good, I finished up by soldering the through-hole components and inserting the socketed chips. It was finally time for the moment of truth. I connected the display, the speaker, and a serial to USB adapter. I powered it up downloaded firmware from my laptop onto the ESP32, and voila! I then got a good night's rest before returning to assemble the input printed circuit board. The input circuit board followed the same general process as the main board. I secured the board in a jig, aligned the stencil, then dispensed and smeared the solder paste across the board. I carefully removed the stencil, and the board was ready for component placement. Using a microscope to closely watch my work, I used tweezers to place all the surface mount components. Once I was done, I placed the board into the reflow oven and started it up. After reflow was complete, I placed and soldered all the through-hole tactile switches. Since mechanical strength and alignment were crucial for these parts, I didn't bother finding them in surface mount. And with that, the input board was complete! With all the electronic components fully assembled and connected, it was finally time for a full-up test. I inserted an SD card, switched on the power, and selected a song. Ah. 
I think we built an Estronic. Before I can call it finished, there's one last thing we need to do. That is installing all the electronic components into the 3D printed case and closing it up. Finally, here we have it, a completed Nestronic Revision B. Now begins the fun of updating the software. There are links in the description to a public repository where I posted all the design files and source code for this project. Additionally, there are also links to a series of blog posts where I cover the architecture and will likely cover any major future project updates. And remember, now you're hacking with power.